theme this year has been truth, and we've talked about that in various ways, and so to introduce this reading tonight, I thought I would just read a, a, a quote from poet Lee Young Lee, who talks about poetry and truth, and I think it's fitting for this year. Um, the poet Lee Young Lee doesn't see poetry as an academic exercise or only for the educational elite. Just the opposite, Lee said. I feel that a poem is the closest thing to complete truth. A poem is so personal, Lee said. I know when I write a poem, I feel it inside. I feel a contact to the divine. When I hear a poet I love at a reading, I feel I'm witnessing someone in contact with the sacred. Hearing a poet read his work is like overhearing somebody talking to God. They're not really talking to you. I love that quote. And I know that it's such a privilege to teach these wonderful students. And I know that something like this happens when they write. It's like an extra thing that gets added, so it's wonderful. Um, <laughs> the program's wrong. <laughs> starting a, a video poem, and don't worry, they're like one minute each, they're going to be six of them, but um, they're very, very, very cool, the video poems are, so they're off the program, but anyway, they, they will be appearing, okay, all right, so we'll start things off with graduating senior Holly Wiegand, and there are six graduating seniors in this class, so come on up. <laughs> for the easy bake. Remember the envy of the 64 count Crayolas, Carnation, Granny Smith, Goldenrod, and Macaroni and Cheese, now waxy stubs. Where are the heaps of twigs and rocks, leaves that were bred for caterpillars and bed sheets for fairies? And mother peddles the red flyer and the dented easy bake at the garage sale. Two Dr. Seuss books for a dollar. My name scrawled inside each cover. And the second poem is called Contraband after Dorian Lopes. The first time was in third grade, a flexible Beverly Cleary paperback resting on my knees just below the tattered arithmetic book. Poring over the Scholastic Club catalog, I circled, starred Little House and Judy Bloom in red marker during recess. Austin was harder to conceal. Thicker than textbooks, enticing my eyes closer, closer to the page and from the diagrammed sentence on the whiteboard. Contraband, detained by Mrs. Shaw, Mr. Bush, teacher after teacher, until the final bell. One smuggled back with a note, try Dickens next. we named John Doe. On the north side of the house, where orange sun, hot copper curtains leave concrete, the wind visited with its white voice, handshakes given to the leaves of an oleander since before the mortgage. The gray hands bent low, reached through the blossoms of July, and tickled out an orange tabby. He, wide shoulders and thick elbows, was bearing too much through the red holes in his ribcage. His tail was blunt and toggled back and forth during the 30 minutes he worked on his first six ounce tuna. In the oleander came the feral earth, 
agent with wide teeth, which drew him back to itself each time he came home breathing too much. Then he was dissolved, losing hair tufts and fox burrs to the earth. He became wind altogether, whooshing in his footsteps back to the north. Gross relaxation. A table turned to rubber after he leaned on it, sagging inward. He then made smooth smooth across all the novels and Bibles on the shelf just by touching them, thumbing pages with grapefruit fingers. When was he ever not touching? throw pillows, couch cushions, suddenly steamy and blow-dried like poodles at a competition. He touched the game remote, now a squishy foam square. A light switch became a golden necktie that smelled like caramel. And when he leaned on the wall, little blue carpet hairs sprouted out like milkweed, soaking in nutrients from drywall. The toilet flushed, and I ducked under Dad's elbow to peek inside. He'd left behind a fuzzy pink seat, and I smelled cherry blossoms drifting from the toilet paper. Weeks ago, my grandfather died, like every grandpa is bound to do. Many grandsons would choke a tear at the news, but he never taught me to fish or made me watch golf. After his first and favorite grandson died, he started looking at life through busted up sunglasses. He and I became disconnected the day he disowned my father for quitting the family business. He became known to me as the alien with the tubes hanging from his nose, as if his body weren't made for this planet. I guess there's redemption, though. I was there when he brought my dad's childhood machete back to its owner. They probably hugged, but it's hard to mend 15 years with a dirty sword. I do think he's in heaven and unchained in that astronaut pose. It's not like I wasn't sad. I sat front row at the funeral. And afterwards at the Triple Tree Bar, I joined the cousins for a shot of tequila in honor of the man who had just started breathing. and 
inventory after face poem by Dorian Locks as well. Your birthmarked skin, constellation skin, chicken pox scarred skin, with your yellow eye teeth, chipped from a wayward golf club teeth, flocks of wild sheep teeth, and your river rock eyes, shallow kitty pool eyes, brown kind of like leaves in February eyes, over your little slit of a mouth, cracked paper mache mouth, two slices of dried apricot mouth. But look at your grandiose nose, grandma's nose, royal adorned corona of a nose. I'm next. This is a poem about how I eat. These people tend to have a problem with it. The name of the poem is I Eat How I Want. Masticating my meals makes most my mates want to maim me. I admit to sloshing soup, smacking sandwiches, slurping soda. I tend to chomp churros and chow on cheese sticks. I munch my mustard, I crunch my custard. The horrible hullabaloo of hunger is so near, I hear it here in my own ear. Um, this poem is about a machine that cleans sheets really fast for like hospitals. It's called, This Machine Cleans Sheets So Fast. <laughs> The bed was empty. The laminator looking device sucked every empty piece of fabric from those semi stiff mattresses. It curdled, it sloshed, it gargled. Then it chortled, washed, and girdled. It fanned, it whistled, it wafted, then it crammed, fizzled, and quaffed. A fresh bed and a new patient, seven seconds. Such innovation, true efficiency, the bleach, white, cotton. The sheets were clean and warm, and all it took was a button. But a button misclicked, mistimed, mismanaged, a button mistouched, mismarked, mishanded, left layers, lie downers, and recliners laminated. And the red bed belonging to nobody. streaks across spines of old books, and a smell that reminds me of winters spent in Aunt Betty's with only books for company spread out around me, which had never been read until me. He wants to prove that it's raining somewhere else, that the water dripping from the cavern ceiling could fall in different places, and that one day there could be no ceiling and only the sky, and not just imitations of the sky. She stood alone and echoed with promises. Today, someone will play the violin, and the sound will choke out the apologies in her throat, canceling every poor judgment, every cruel sound. It may be able to reach the world, maybe enough to transform. Forever. Forty years later, 
I don't regret my thoughts about the physical state and being of Miss Hank on that Valentine's Day. Still his skin perplexes me. Never have I worn softer. My adoration for her was all the more justified when I finally allowed myself to try her on. She had always advanced, she had advanced in years by this time, but the regiment upon which I had hid slowed the aging process considerably. She had bubbled and grown upon her passing, and she flowed loosely from my arms, the sleeves were wizard upon the wire frame of myself. She was roomier than the land had been, and her nose conformed to my own much better. I have been asked whether I regret my thoughts and acts, but I restate, I hold no regrets. <laughs> Rebirth 2010. They say nobody in their right mind would want to resurrect middle school. No one wants to remember the picket fence imprint of braces on lips, the experiments in hairdos and electric blue eyeliner, or the rich and almost cheese-like stench of pubescent locker room sweat. <laughs> but I open my fist to these things. High water jeans, sharpie reminders on dampened palms, and an art room full of 12-year-old sopranos singing Ayaz's replay. Those were the days before I learned about the art of grieving and how it feels to see your mother cry. Rebirth 2011. God carried the world in her womb. I could never write a poem about feminism because I'm afraid of what my dad might say. I'm afraid my Baptist, him warbled dad might never meet my eyes, might say, this isn't who God wants you to be. I'm afraid my grandpa might tell me I'm wrong, or that my mom will shrug her shoulders and say, some things are better left unsaid. I'm afraid my professors would lose respect, or my friends might stop inviting me around. I'm afraid I might never get married, because my uncle once said, no man wants a wife with a mind like yours. But I'm afraid for my sisters and for any woman my brothers love. I'm afraid for teenagers with acne, the girls who are bullied because they don't use cover up and the boys who are bullied because they do. I'm afraid for my brothers who are called sissies and pussies and nancies. I'm afraid for my sisters in flowered church dresses singing about being God's sons passive hands resting on the back of the next pew. I'm afraid for my friend who is told she reasons like a man, and for her mother who told her she needs to be more sensitive, like a woman. I'm afraid for my brothers who are called manly men when they are loud or obnoxious or when they get in a fist fight with a boy at school. I'm afraid for anyone who hears the phrase, boys will be boys. Things I fixed. A porcelain dove I knocked off my bookshelf after nudging it with a copy of A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Hand me down jeans that dragged on the floor. And once I duct taped my headlight in place after Alec at Oil Can Henry's broke the clip. Other people's grammar, telling them when it's okay to use the word pry. And I probably fixed the hole in the fence, but I never went back to make sure because I got distracted when I painted our shed a shade of ash, since ivory just doesn't work in a farm town. Speaking of manure, I fixed the smell of the air a few times, leaving lavender bouquets around the house, filling the sink with lemon pine salt and letting it just sit. When I was 11, I fixed my mom's jewelry box after my brother snapped the hinge and he gave it back to her, biting his lip, saying, now you can put your pearls back. And I put my hand on his shoulder instead of telling him the truth, because nothing is as simple as silver clasps and ocean seeds, and mom doesn't have pearls. At the sharp fences, Sometimes I think to myself about the sky that has been hung in wire 
These stiff wriggles, black rigidities, are evidence for a woven basket tangled up high, higher where the air is tinier than the space between a thumb and forefinger when someone rubs them for money. My guard says the tight lines are not this, but the thinnesses of a woman's hair whose scalp got trapped in her loom, holding her down, budging, shoving at the wood contraption for almost 300 years. My euro flipping catches, slants the light, and I stare unceasingly at a hole in the basket where streams through a gleam in a cool white burn. My tear ducts twinge, begging to recover from the drying or piercing. I wait a while to know if this brightness is meant for human eyes. It began with a sign, literally a sign, Goodyear tires, lit up bluer than the sky. And the moment she sounded out the syllables in the car, the closed fist of the world opened and she could read. She pointed, her finger smudging the window. Mama, look, Goodyear. Her mother looked at her in the rear view mirror, smiled. Yeah, baby, we'll have a good year. Heck, we're gonna have a great year, just the two of us. She smiled back. Her untied shoes scuffed the top of the suitcase wedged beneath her seat, and she watched the sign until she couldn't see it anymore. It would be 10 years before she read the same sign again. The second one's called Trapped. It's fate, he said, sitting on the grungy elevator floor, legs sprawled. Fate is pulling us together again. She rolled her eyes. She had wedged herself as far as she could into the opposite corner and started fanning herself with one hand. Or maybe the universe hates me, she muttered. You never could appreciate the higher powers at work, he sighed. The only power I appreciate is electricity, he sighed again. I don't understand you, he said. We had a good thing going, didn't we? We should probably call someone, she mused, glancing at the elevator doors. Surely someone would have noticed the elevator had stopped by now? Don't you miss us, he asked. Right, yeah, someone should miss us eventually, she said. She stood and examined the elevator buttons, pressed one, nothing. With a huff, she sat back down, drummed her fingernails on the floor. He picked at the scab on his knee. In answer to your question, no, I don't, she said. I don't miss us. He was silent. I mean, she looked at her distorted reflection on the metal wall. I miss some things, like, like that beach trip, and the late night study sessions, and, and the way you used to call me in the middle of the day just to, just to say, she trailed off, shook her head. But once that all ended, no, I don't miss us. I miss you, he said. I'm sorry. With a hum and a clunk, the elevator started moving again. He stood first, offered her a hand. He smiled. She stared. She took his hand. Pomeranian days. I used to wake up every morning in my field of blankets to a wild orange dandelion spinning and jumping excitedly as if it were being blown and battered by the wind. I used to go on walks through shadow hills, my dandelion nearby. That silly little puff could float for miles. I, w I used to wonder why my orange dandelion petals began to turn white and why his two little seeds began to shine a little less bright. I used to explain to people that my dandelion was 119 years old when he wilted. He was happy till the end, and so was I. What's Broken by Holly Begand. The retina of my right eye, the toaster that always burns the bread. For two years, the back seat belts of my first car. Grandpa fixed those last summer. Maps from 1492, overripe bananas, scout 
my sister's three-legged tabby. In fourth grade, my perfect attendance when I got bronchitis. The missing Monopoly pieces, knee holy jeans, my cell phone screen. 25 years ago, both of dad's wrists from too much rugby. American index fingers pointing blame, lips that hiss only slander. This is a poem called Poetic Tailor. I'm a poetic tailor, stitching together clashing ideas to sound profound. I write on the kitchens of sun-dried peaches and fun-sized gums, excited to share the love of pastel parenting. I write of corporate fathers filling the skies, free from the bounds of society, the brief break from monogamous monotony until concrete meets and they join the city cacophony. I write of warnings, reminded of brothers in wooden suits, an inch eternal room beneath eight feet of earth warm, warm sky. I write on the machine gun wound. Through word, I make sense of a clashing life of left ideas and memories fading from view, trying to sound as profound as a poetic tailor ought to. so short you guys <laughs> okay the trouble with my mother sorry mom the trouble with my mother i realized today is not that we don't get along because we do more than most mothers and daughters do i think but that we get along so well i'm afraid of becoming just like her i already sound like her my father will mistake my voice for hers when i answer the phone hey honey how's your day oh fine by the way this is your daughter speaking <laughs> Only recently did I notice the way she holds herself in a crowd, the same way I do, leaning on one foot, hands on hips, brow creased in concentration. And for years, I avoided cutting my hair because I was afraid my curls would curl tighter around my face and making my mother's unintentionally. But when my mother said she didn't want anything to do with my grandmother, who died when my mother was 13, an age too young to begin resenting someone, I realized I'm not like her at all. I didn't realize I was stopped at a green light until a white suburban rushed by me, spitting rain and road grime from its back tires, startling my hand from where it had been supporting my face. It was then I noticed a little boy with a Spider-Man backpack walking on the sidewalk home from school, lips forming words, maybe a rhyme. John Mayer saying, stop this train, I want to go home again from Bluetooth, and I wondered if the light had been red or green when I had first paused, traffic obstruction, and why the car behind me had never beeped a warning. I'm not even so good. Got you for common good. If he saw you, where you're standing, wouldn't stay. 
understand where I stood. I'm taking a legend, how about your name and your number? I maybe some when you better like what you do with your brother. Where remind your mother when she was a little bit younger, and your father liked the boys from way down on this. You know I matched your book, and then you plucked your throat jerk can with the over inflated muscles of the baseball spray sand. Executing very clean the model name game plan, but then you boy from another bona fide English man. Tell me, 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 your name.
time to go, Tessa said with a sharp nod. The Moors were nice people, the dot-your-eyes kind of couple. They had schedules for the bathrooms and for dinners. It wasn't too bad to know which foods to expect, but all the food tasted the same to me, like cardboard. Mrs. Moore, that, I guess, didn't add a single spice or extra flavor to any of her food. Mr. and Mrs. Moore didn't have any kids of their own, but kept a healthy cycle of foster kids running in and out of their house. Two rooms upstairs for girls under 13, basement for girls 13 and older. I was in the basement with a girl named Gloria, an asthmatic insomniac. She had purple hair and a series of garden tattoos on her left arm, a few big leafy plants, and a nasty beetle. I had to wonder if she had a fake ID or something to get them. She had been there for at least a year when I came, and she had clearly decorated the room herself. There were big oriental drapes pinned to the walls and little plants in the windowsills, almost too high to reach, definitely too high to enjoy looking at. Every morning before walking upstairs for breakfast, she would grab a bottle of body spray off her dresser and spritz it on her wrists. She swore it was a cherry blossom scent, but I couldn't smell a thing. After living there for two months, things started to feel a little normal. Can't get comfortable, Gloria's voice whispered through the night static. I turned my head to see her staring at me from her side of the room. This bed isn't comfortable. She eyed me curiously. It's memory foam. Well, I like my bed at home. She let out a puff of air. Oh, yeah. You going home soon then, she asked, still staring at me. Don't know. But you want to, don't you? She chuckled, don't really have one. Oh, I'm sorry, I really meant it. She was silent for 10 minutes. What's your home like? I glared at the Amish quilt tucked under my crossed arms. A lot dirtier than Bet would approve of. She laughed real hard at that. Can I ask you something personal? She asked, no longer staring at me. Okay, why are you here? I sucked my tongue back for a minute. Jason, your mom's boyfriend? Something like that. Sorry, me too, you? The family I was staying with before decided 16 was too old. How long have you been in the system? I was seven. Oh. I pulled the quilt up to my nose, wondering if cutting off air supply would make me go to sleep faster. It smelled very faintly of soap for one whiff, then it was gone. The next morning, I sprayed a little cherry blossom on my neck before leaving for school, and I pretended I could smell it. The idea was nice. I was visiting with my mom not long after when she told me she had dumped Jason. For good, I asked behind closed eyelids. I hope so, she sighed. I smiled. So you're going home pretty soon, Gloria asked, a little breathless as she climbed on a stool to water her plants. I think so. I'll miss you, she grinned at me from higher up. Yeah, me too. I ran my socked foot in circles over the carpet. Do you want to take a plant with you? I can't promise it will survive. She scrunched her face in pain. If you gave me one, I would do my best to keep it alive. I spent the next weekend at my mom's. A test run, Tessa told me. I set my bag on the door on top of kitty litter particles and dustpan remnants. From the oven, I smelled a mixture of chicken garlic and my mom's god-awful perfume. I bit my cheek to keep from smiling. What's got you all happy? Nothing, Mom. It's just good to be home. We'll set the table. Dinner will be ready in ten minutes. I'm going to have a quick smoke. She kissed my cheek and brushed my arm on her way to the patio. I turned to the cupboard and chewed a cat off the counter. I stopped and stared out the window at the yard. The grass was yellowed and matted and looked like Jason's greasy hair. There was no sign of life out there, not even weeds. Gloria would hate it here. My heart jumped at the thought. I caught sight of Mom's crucifix necklace hanging from the window's curtain rod like a drying bouquet, and I could hear Mrs. Moore say, Jesus will bring peace if you ask. Two weeks later, on a Sunday, my mom drove her moldy 2002 Toyota to the Moore's home. They stayed home from church to see me off, which was special because they never skipped church. Gloria was there too. She handed me a little fern in a hand-painted jar. 
Her name is Catherine, she said pointedly before doling out instructions for proper care. I smiled weakly, feeling, st feeling sticky from the humidity. Call me if you need anything, Mrs. Moore blurted. My mom scowled at her. Bye. I lifted my hand in a stiff wave, my mother's left arm tightly around my shoulder. And I didn't know whether I was supposed to be looking in front of me or behind.
time for bed. Go to sleep. Rest your head. Don't you weep. Morning will come in just a few. Dream of all the things you could do. You could snuggle your cat. You could put on a hat. You could eat some pancakes. You could eat some cornflakes. You could water the plant. You could paint a red ant. You could say hi to mom. You could say hi to Tom. You could say hi to Lonnie, Johnny, or Ron. You could swing from the tree. You could sip some sweet tea. You could sing with the birds. You could say funny words. Like Bobungus. You could play with your toys. You could make a loud noise, like a burp. You could watch a cartoon. You could pop a balloon. All these things wait for you. Dream of all the things you can do. Who rumpled my bed? When Robert went to sleep, he would sleep deeply in the smooth, clean bed. When he got up, he would tend his bed first before anything else. Then he would play outside with sticks and glow bugs, then inside with dinosaurs and trains on tracks. One night, a lightning storm visited their town. It shook the trees outside in a powerful wind. Flashy zigzags of white and yellow curled around the rainy air. Robert sat with his parents on the family couch all through the night. They told him how moving clouds rubbed together until they let loose a big blast of electricity. <laughs> Robert gazed out the wet windows. He wondered how wrinkly the clouds would get after all the rushing and lightning blasting. He wondered if anyone ever folded them or tucked their corners down tight. In the morning, Robert went to his room and found something shocking. His bedroom window had been left open all night. Not only that, but his bed was all ruffled up. The pillowcase was scuffed, the blanket muffed, and the sheets all stuffed up. Who rumpled my bed, he thought. A furry shadow shot out from under his desk, headed straight to his dresser. Robert heard scratching and bumping from the dresser. He pulled open the drawers and found that all his t-shirts were bunged and wrinkled. Robert showed his parents the bed and the dresser, but they didn't believe his furry shadow story. They only told him to fold his clothes or else he would be raking leaves in the backyard. That night, he heard the wrinkle monster wrestling around the room. It was next to the dresser, in the closet, under the bed, and over by the window. Robert woke to find his room a disastrous wrinkle mess. His pants, shorts, and shoes were all muffled. The dinosaur and train track toys were crumpled. There were rumples in the carpet, rumples in the curtains, even rumples on the walls. <laughs> Robert decided it was time to get wise against this scrunchy creature of fuzz. The wrinkle monster must be stopped, he thought. Robert nabbed some clean socks from the laundry room, and he set them in a neat pile on his wrinkled carpet. Immediately, the wrinkle monster appeared, and it was wrinkling and crinkling all the socks. Robert tossed out fresh socks. The monster crinkled each new pair, again and again and again. Robert ran out of socks, but he wasn't done yet. He pulled off his socks and tossed them like a football. The wrinkle monster jumped after them, right into the dryer. Slam! <coughs> Robert shut the hatch and set the batch of clothes to wrinkle release, per press. <laughs> when Robert popped open the hatch, a different kind of monster tumbled out. The fur was silky soft and free of any stiff ridges or shadowy rumbles. It set straight robbers' dinosaurs and train tracks. It 
tended his bed, tightened down all the corners, and made the pillow lie flat. The monster righted his curtains, folded his shorts, and paired up his socks. It helped Robert flatten towels, rugs, napkins. Robert forgot what a crinkle looked like, what a furrow felt like, or what a rumble smelled like. The end. So, and everyone's going to sing, so it's a group effort, really. <laughs> okay, so this is called Stories of the Wind. Megan Lee was a girl who couldn't sing. Whenever she tried to make any sort of noise, except for talk, and sometimes yell, nothing would come out like someone was holding her tongue, or like the air was being sucked right out of her song. However, she had songs in her heart, her mind, and even her tummy, and she had to get them out somehow. So she told them to the bluebird outside her window every morning who showed up with the sun and whistled early June tunes. She whispered it to the sink in the kitchen who repeated back a steady bass beat, a drip, drip, drip that bounced from the tile floor to the popcorn ceiling. She talked her songs to the couch cushions, the water pipes, and the window panes, and they answered back with whooshes, clangs, and loud wings. One night, she asked her dad in a quiet voice if he would listen to the words of her song. It's a special one, she told him. I got it from the wind. So her dad listened really closely and wrote down a few words. He got up when she was sleeping, humming a note. When Megan Lee woke up the next morning, her bird neighbor didn't greet her. The faucet was quiet downstairs. The windows, windows were still and the pipes didn't ring. Confused, she started to walk down the stairs. With the thump, thump, thump of her steps, she started to hear the quieter drip, drip, drip of the faucet. There is a rhythmic whoosh, like the sound of the breeze through tall blades of grass. There was a whistle and a hum, and Megan Lee began to think she might know that song. There her dad sat on a stool, guitar in his lap, strumming her new favorite tune. He laughed when he saw her and, w saw her and whistled out a start. Mom was there too, harmonica in hand. <laughs> Megan Lee laughed with glee, took in a big, big deep breath, and let her song free.
You're such a pretty skunk. I always said that. Drink in the rain, little neighbor. If the clouds part, study the hieroglyph of stars. You and your clan ambled under our deck and stayed too long. Oh, I wish you had chosen the sycamore by the stream out back. And now here we are, you in the metal cage. I don't know how to open cold in this February rain. I did have a pet skunk once, if that helps us any. I named him Ralph. He gathered our crocheted coasters, carried them under the couch one by one, curled around my neck, and slept close. We marched in a Fourth of July parade together. Then he went to live with the governor's pilot who taught him tricks and kept him for years. The gray-shirted man who studies cages, I think he's, he's on his way. Oh, little neighbor, remember the delicate hands of the blueberry bushes, the lazy circuit of the moon.